Am I on? Perfect. So welcome everyone. Now the time is a little past 10, so I think we should start. And um, I just have yeah, a very short, uh, a little bit uh, disappointing announcement that one of the speakers unfortunately had to cancel in the last minute due to some sickness. So uh, uh, Chris Ludvigsen, who is a former captain and who actually sailed these, these, uh, these waters that we'll talk about today, he unfortu unfortunately cannot be here today. But we'll uh, try to manage without him. And uh, so again, welcome to all of you uh, to this seminar about countering pir piracy in the Gulf of Guinea. My name is Marie Base, and I'm a communications officer and journalist here at DIES. And my role today will be to give an introduction just now and then through a few questions for, for our speakers, get us through this, this uh, one and a half hours that we have now. Um, so I will start by saying a little bit about this area and the amount of piracy attacks that uh, that we experience at the moment in, in the Gulf of Guinea. And then Jessica Larsen, uh, who's a senior researcher from DIES, uh, will come on stage and talk about this Yaundi code of conduct. We were supposed to uh, make an infrastructure to combat piracy. Then uh, Stephanie Shandoff, a research assistant at the uh, 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 University of Copenhagen, will come on stage and say something about some concrete initiatives that have come out of this giant infrastructure. And then we have uh, Dirk Siebler, is that correctly? Um, senior advisor at Risk Intelligence and uh, Jakob Larsen, head of maritime security at the world's largest uh, shipping organization, BIMCO, um, who will uh, come on stage and answer some questions about what's the role for private security or private armed guards. So, but um, mm, first of all, yeah, these are the, the experts and unfortunately Chris Ludwigsen is not here today. Um, So this is the, the area that we are talking about. I just uh, found a, a, yeah, a picture on Google Maps, but it's just to get an idea of how large this, this area, um, the Gulf of Guinea, actually is. Um, but before, before we start, uh, I, would, I actually have uh, just two questions for you here in the audience. Uh, just to get an idea of, of who you are. Um, so if you could just raise your hands, how many of you are from the shipping industry or connected to maritime security? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so a few people. And uh, how, how many of you have been in this area in the Gulf of Guinea? On a ship or just in the area? You've been on a ship. Oh, so maybe you should come up and replace Chris. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Super. Um, well, so this is the area that we're talking about. Um, and... Uh, It's a little difficult to 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 get get an idea of how large the area is, and I tried to make some comparisons, and just to look up what would it amount to, and it was something like six times the size of Germany or something. So it's just a very very large area that, um, as you all know. Uh, heavily affected by piracy and that the international community have tried for yeah, more than a decade 
to stop piracy in this area. Um, and uh, this is an overview of, of the world's ship, shipping traffic. Um, and uh, I think I should be able to just click it and no, it's no, it's not sharing. But if we zoom in, we can see that. Uh, let me just get back to my. Sorry about this. Close this. Um, if we zoom in on this area that we're talking about today, it's just an area with with. And a heavy amount of, of uh, shipping traffic and a lot of ships also have to go into port. So it's a really fragile area, as many of you have, uh, probably know, um, where ships are yeah, fragile to, to piracy attacks. Um, and, um, and the newest data on piracy attacks, this, this is an overview of attacks that I um, downloaded a few weeks ago, but the newest uh, data on piracy in the Gulf of Guinea, um, the, the latest piracy report from the International Mar Maritime Bureau has revealed that, um, that there's been a rise uh, in, reporters, in reported incidents in this area. And the, the report showed an increase um, with 21 incidents in the first nine months of this year, compared to only 14 in incidents during the same period last year. And uh, the, the, the safety of crew, crew members is sort of a mounted concern uh, since 50, 54 people were taken hostage and 14 were kidnapped and two were actually in injured. Um, so, so it's it's uh it's a dangerous area uh to come to 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 sail uh if you're in in the shipping industry um and uh and difficult and and so large so difficult to to maybe protect the ships um so i think uh now i will uh just I have to mention before before I invite uh, Stephanie uh, well, Jessica Larsen, a uh, senior researcher here from DIES, on stage. I have to remember to say that this seminar is part of of the project Counter Piracy Infrastructure in the Gulf of Guinea, which was funded by a grant uh, from the Danish minist uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and ad administered by the Danita Fellowship Center. Um, so Jessica, I will, would like to invite you uh, on stage now. Um, Thank you. And uh, and you'll say a little bit about how this uh, Yaoundi Code of Conduct was supposed to make the Gulf of Guinea more secure place for seafarers. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all these faces, new and familiar ones. Am I going through okay? I was told I got a completely new microphone and it's very crisp. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Marie, also. <laughs> so, uh, I can't get this. I'll have to hold it in my hands. So, okay. So today we're speaking about private uh, security as a tool to protect merchant vessels operating in the Gulf of Guinea. But I'm actually going to start the seminar by talking about what has been done over the past decade. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, from the public side, in other words, states and international organizations uh, collaborating with states. Because when it comes to vessel protection, states hold the monopoly of violence, right? Of course, there are many exceptions to this. Just think of the Wagner Group or the topic of the seminar today,
but states, all things equal, are responsible and accountable for ensuring uh, safety at sea and protecting seafarers and responding if there is a piracy incident. So to understand why it's relevant and necessary to even discuss the prospects of private armed security to protect international shipping, we need to know what public actors are doing <laughs> and what they're not doing and perhaps, um, let's say, what they're not achieving to address piracy. And I'll explain the intentions from the public side and suggest uh, some of the problems that it faces currently. So there's a shortcut to explaining what efforts intended to suppress piracy in the Gulf of Guinea look like. <laughs> and it is a map that looks like this. Mm. So this is um, the Gulf of Guinea, obviously, and overlaying the Gulf of Guinea in West Africa is uh, this legend called the Yaounde, or we call it the Yaounde architecture. Now, the Yaounde architecture is a maritime security infrastructure, let's say, which consists of a spread of maritime zones and centers um, in the different countries that I'll get back to in a moment. They stretch across West and Central Africa, um, and they're intended to maintain security at sea. Today you may hear about the Yaounde Code of Conduct, and this is a document that was signed in 2013 by coastal states, or states in the entire region actually, not only coastal states, um, and they sort of pledged that they would collaborate around strengthening maritime security structures and uh, collaborate around um, interventions to fight maritime crime here under piracy, so not only piracy. And implementing the Yaounde Code of Conduct is basically what produced the architecture that you see here on the map. So getting to the legends, first of all, the waters of the coastal states are divided into five operational um, maritime operational zones. Um, called A to G, although for reasons unknown to me, uh, B and C do not exist. Um, <laughs> and this is a kind of divide and rule feature where coastal states have responsibility for the zone that they're in and they can collaborate around information sharing and incident response with other states in the zone. And then moving ashore, each country has a maritime operations center, a MUC, and this is supposed to sort of collect relevant actors in a hub, which is responsible for the state's activities at sea. Then because each state is within one of these five operational maritime zones, they establish the MMCCs, which is the Multinational Maritime Coordination Center, and they are pretty much as they sound. Uh, centers staffed with multinational naval officers and such from the zones <coughs> uh, countries that are intended to then sit together and monitor and coordinate activities and information sharing within um, their zone. Are you with me? <laughs> and then there is uh, the regional level. <coughs> so West African countries under ECOWAS, the uh, economic community uh, of West, West African states, established something called CRESMAO, and this is a French acronym which says regional uh, coordination center in West Africa. And similarly in Central Africa, countries under ECAS, the economic um, community of uh, Central African states have the same and is called CRESMAC. So we actually, we have national centers, we have multinational coordination centers within each maritime zone. We have regional coordination centers and what do we need in on top of the regional coordination center? We need an inter-regional coordination center, of course, the ICC, and that's located in Cameroon with the star in the middle. Um, and that is intended to coordinate and share information between the regional coordination centers and identify training and education needs and, uh, and more. So in a moment, Stephanie is going to speak about some of the initiatives that came out of the Yoanda architecture. Uh, on a national level within the region, so I won't go into that, but I will mention that a range of international partners with stakes in maritime <coughs> security began developing projects and programs to basically assist with the implementation of the code of conduct. And this assistance could be uh, warships, um, doing training and exercises with regional navies, uh, France, Spain, US, uh, states like that have done it. Uh, many external actors also have 
different variations of capacity building programs where Denmark is one example. So since uh, the mid 2010s, we have had multiple um, activities funded through the EU and the UN to support, uh, for example, training of navies, developing maritime security strategies in regional states, supporting law enforcement at sea through donating equipment. Um, and more recently, there's a focus on uh, supporting uh, states to sort of do piracy prosecution, so um, updating criminal codes and training the judiciary through mock trials. Actual international counter piracy missions are less prevalent, and this is of course where private protection comes into the picture. Um, you may remember that, sorry, Denmark uh, deployed a frigate a couple of years ago. Spain, I mean, sorry, Italy has also uh, done a similar counter piracy mission. You may also remember that Denmark apprehended some suspects, and um, it ended up that there was actually no real collaboration with regional states around that incident and also around the prosecution afterwards, um, which is of course an underlying assumption with this architecture that maritime security operations are uh, undertaken in and by the region. Um, but in fact, so far only three piracy incidents have led to apprehension of suspects and evidence collection and subsequent um, court ca uh, cases. So three. And I think this figure is really food for thought given uh, the number of attacks in the region are in the hundreds and given that the Yonda architecture has existed for uh, 10 years. So I bring this up because I think it's a pertinent illustration of the state of the Yaounda architecture and the challenges that it faces. So looking at how this is the case, I think there are at least three reasons that I'll leave you with. So firstly, the Yaounda architecture is an extremely heavy structure. And I, I've just tried to explain all the centers and the zones and so on. And I'm sure you can imagine that it's quite a mouthful to, um, let's say, build and equip and staff and manage and train and operate such an intricate uh, infrastructure. And it stretches across 19 states with different political systems and different legal cultures and different languages even. And it doesn't only spread geographically, it also spreads thin the resources. Um, and the thing is that piracy mostly emanates from Nigeria, but all the way from Senegal to Angola, um, these structures are being implemented. So of course, the structure here can also deal with other crimes than piracy. But I think, um, with sort of having national and multinational centers and coordination centers on different levels. You probably know the expression death by PowerPoint and this seems a little bit like death by center. Um, so the point is, well, I've interviewed people who, who call the Yonda architecture um, a monster that needs feeding <laughs> and other people are more diplomatic, but, but the, the basically the point is that the architecture would need some, some trimming um, to be responsive and to be uh, effective. And then add to that the many cooks, right? The more countries, the more authorities, the more centers you have, the more um, differing security again agendas and differing national interests you will have potentially blocking sort of efficient responses at sea. And of course, add to that also some level of corruption among um, officials, um, public officials, and, and it really becomes quite problematic. The second reason why the Yonda architecture has not been able to quell piracy attacks is that it doesn't address the drivers of piracy, it doesn't address the root causes, um, doesn't incorporate on land perspectives that can divert the criminal energy away from the sea and into legal activities, if you will. Now, the intention of the architecture is not to provide legitimate jobs to these young men that are prone to being um, um, uh, recruited into piracy gang gangs, but it is a never-ending spiral. Uh, so if the same level, level of effort that we see in the Yoant architecture is not applied to the fight against the root causes, then it will be a never-ending spiral. And then finally, uh, thirdly, uh, we get to the topic of today. The Yoant architecture unfortunately doesn't really engage civil society as a way of developing solutions to the problem of piracy, and this could be everything from private um, security to protect uh, shipping um, vessels and uh, to engaging local fishing communities in prevention activities um, or surveillance of suspicious behavior as they move between land and sea. 
Now, these activities are taking place, but on a very small scale so far. So some states, as we'll hear today, do provide protection to shipping, of course. But again, it's not a concerted effort um, that's approached in a structured and region-wide way. And I'm sure that there are people that may say, even maybe people on the panel today, that, that'll say that it doesn't have to be region-wide and coordinated. And you know, I actually do agree with that. However, there is a fundamental dilemma that I'll now leave you with, because vessels need protection in an area that spans many coastal states' waters, so engagement of these countries is essential. Uh, to ensure political buy-in and the necessary legal frameworks to, to do these private operations. So anyway, I'm getting ahead of a more detailed discussion that I'm sure we'll get to, so I'm just going to say thank you for your attention and leave the stage to Stephanie. Yeah, thank you so much, Jessica, and uh, and uh, Stephanie will will now say a little bit about what concrete initiatives have come out of this monster that needs feeding, or this uh, apart from these different zones and centers. What has the Yonda code of conduct, this architecture, what has it? Yeah. So which, uh, yeah, what are the concrete initiatives that have uh, come out of this, uh, this architecture, Stephanie? All right. Thank you. Sounds good, right? Okay, now we are good. Okay, so I was saying I'm, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here because we have looked at the structure, we have looked at some of the problems that um, arise from this structure. And now we want to look at some of the concrete initiatives or successes, if you will, that have been drawn from this architecture. So just staying on this figure, Right. I, I want to start with this and talk about what we experience in the Gulf of region um, in the Gulf of Guinea region currently. So at the top we have the interregional coordination center, which um, Jessica spoke about, and that was actually established in September 2014, but became operational much later in 2017. And then the two regional maritime security centers, Cresmau and Cresmac. Right, Cresmac um, started functioning earlier in 2014, and then Cresmau was formally declared operational just last year in 2022. Now I'm hoping this highlights some of the nuances within the architecture itself, because you see how um, even with the, the structures that we have here, which came from the Yaoundé Code of Conduct, there are different timelines to um, when they were operationalized, right? So um, let me, let me try and get this back to my presentation. Sorry, no, mm. it's just the <laughs> okay, so um, Article 11 and 12 of the Yaoundé Code of Conduct. Bear with me here, I'll be making references to articles in the Code of Conduct. Articles 11 and um, 12 require these centers that we mentioned earlier, Cresmac and Cresmau, to um, disseminate information, right? The emphasis there is on incident reporting and information sharing. And so the interesting thing here is that we do have some of this dissemination going on in the region. I mean, both Cresmac and Cresmau have bulletins that they share um, that provide information to relevant actors on incident updates that have occurred um, in the course of the month, right? And then moving lower down the structure, if you still have the picture in mind, we talked about the multinational maritime coordination centers. Um, the interesting thing here, too, is that up until 2022, two of the, the, the five um, 
zones were not operational. So that, that was zone A and G. Jessica mentioned it. I hope you still have the picture in your mind. Two of the five zones were not operational. Um, zone G was inaugurated just last year in 2022, and efforts are still in place to operationalize zone A. Um, now, the maritime operation centers at the lowest levels within each of the Gulf of Guinea states do exist, but um, as with all the other centers in the architecture, there are staffing and um, technological capacity limitations. So what I want to, you know, briefly touch on following this is the broad spectrum of state commitments um, to address piracy and armed robbery at sea flowing from the, the Yaoundé Code of Conduct and from the structure that we saw in the diagram. And I think Article um, 4 of the Yaoundé Code of Conduct provides a starting point for exploring this. Uh, because at the national level, the signatory states are expected to have in place appropriate national um, maritime security policies and legislations to safeguard the ocean space. And this is key because the Yaoundé Code of Conduct itself is not a legally binding agreement, right? So there's a huge level of um, commitment and political will um, that is required on the part of signatory states to domesticate its, its provisions. At one point that I should mention here is that um, there, there was some level of effort by African states to move towards um, an, a, a legally binding agreement with regards to maritime security. Of course, this is not directly um, just for the Yaoundé Code of Conduct states, but across Africa, broadly speaking. Um, because in 2016, we had um, the Lome Charta on maritime security which was adopted under the auspices of the AU and it really presented a unique opportunity for for states to move towards a binding law unfortunately the charter never received the ratifications that were needed to pass it into um, you know a, a binding legal instrument and we we have only three states that had ratified it as of last year. I don't know how things are looking this year, but um, it's, it's pretty clear that because um, it's been such a long stretch of time since the, the charter was developed to begin with, it's sort of dwindled into the background. And now let's talk about anti-piracy legislations because um, if we cannot have a, a regional or you know african legally binding instrument then perhaps the next important thing is to ensure that adequate legislations are in place right to to at least domesticate the provisions of the yaoundé code of conduct and in fact um, signatory countries are encouraged to do so signatory states are encouraged to do so in article um, 15 of the the code of conduct so anti-piracy legislations are a key part of this. Um, and so in 2016, Togo adopted an act um, to address maritime piracy and unlawful um, acts at sea. This was more or less a modification of its penal code, but it, it does serve the purpose. There was talk of reforming this act in 2021, um, but so far, at the very least, the act has made possible one of the three prosecutions of um, piracy cases that Jessica talked about earlier. And then we also have um, Nigeria's Suppression of Piracy and Other Maritime Offenses Act, which made possible the other two prosecutions, right? So one from Togo, two from Nigeria. Cameroon has an anti-piracy legislation in place as of um, December last year, but there haven't been any prosecutions on that front yet. And it, it does appear that Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Cabo Verde also have some prosecutorial capacity right, for maritime piracy offenses. And then, of course, Ghana, Benin, and Cote d'Ivoire have um, piracy legislations that are still pending, some of which are in parliament, you know, um, awaiting. <laughs> the grand finish. Um, but it's, it's interesting to 
just note again that regardless of all these anti-piracy legislations that um, are in place, regardless of the fact that we are seeing a proliferation of anti-piracy legislations across the West African sub-region, there have been only three piracy prosecutions, right? And perhaps this points to complexities linked to giving a legal finish to the, the maritime crimes that occur in the region. Um, so it's not just about having the legislations in place, having the anti-piracy legislations in place. It's also about ensuring that the national and regional agencies, for instance, are able to work together collaboratively um, to coordinate efforts um, so that maritime criminal groups are actually apprehended to begin with and so that they are able to present um, coherent evidence across the national maritime agencies involved. And to a large extent, that is where harmonized standard operation procedures come in. We have a few in the region. I mean, currently Nigeria has an HN HSOP, I'm abbreviating, <laughs> um, which um, came into force in 2016. Ghana has one which came up in 2021 and Togo in 2022. In all of these states, what really exists is a, a broad range of institutions and agencies that are intended to address maritime security, right? Some with overlapping mandates in the area of maritime security. In Ghana, for instance, we have about 20 government agencies um, that have one role or another to play in maritime security governance. And you, you can see how this is um, problematic. Is these challenges of um, interagency coordination in Ghana, where I'm from, that led to the, the stalling of the launch of Ghana's National Integrated um, Maritime Strategy for more than three years. Okay, let me move quickly here. So I'm, I'm lumping these up so that we can move faster. Naval exercises, joint patrols, handover uh, agreements. Um, the, the Yaoundé Code of Conduct did manage to garner some momentum for, for states in terms of you know, um, operational exercises at the, the national level aimed at addressing piracy. I mean, Nigeria always um, played a forerunner role when it, it came to these um, operations. Nigeria has been actively engaged in like intensive operational exercises um, in, its, in, in the region, particularly in its waters, since 2016. And from 2016 till now, it's actually been about 20 intensive operations in the region, if you check from the Nigerian Navy website. Um, but it's interesting that the bulk of those initiatives were between 2016 and 2017, and even then, oh, hold on. And even then, there was a, a surge in, in piracy and armed robbery at sea incidents. So that brings to question what indeed these operations were, were accomplishing in the period. But I think what stands out more recently is Nigeria's Deep Blue Project, um, which has been in place since 2021. Within the context of the Gulf of Guinea, is a massive one um, with asset acquisitions of up to like, $195 million. Um, and as a matter of fact, when you have conversations with, you know, Nigerian naval officers and, you know, maritime law enf uh, enforcement officers in Nigeria, you get the sense of pride about the Deep Blue Project. A lot of them attribute um, the decline in piracy incidents that occurred um, between the end of 2021 and 2022 to this um, Deep Blue Project. Uh, then there have also been joint patrols in the region, and normally these joint patrols happen um, according to the, the different zones that we have, because the zones um, have MOUs, memorandum of understanding, memorandum of understanding between them to facilitate these joint patrols. So we have one in place for zone D, zone E, zone F. Um, zone G doesn't have a standing MOU amongst the states, but um, joint patrols have been going on in the, the Zone G region since 2021. 
And why is this issue of joint patrols important? It's important because there are complexities surrounding the, the right of hot, well, let me say, in, invoking um, hot pursuit of pirates across the, the national jurisdictions of the Gulf of Guinea coastal states. You have instances where navies may have to pursue pirates to, you know, other coastal jurisdictions. And it's these joint patrols that make it easier for, for, for the navies across the region to build that kind of collaborative spirit that is needed to invoke this um, hot pursuit. And then more recently, last year, ECOWAS um, states adopted a supplementary agreement for the transfer of pirates and um, su piracy suspects and evidence for prosecution. This ha this has proved really important. Agreements like this for the Gulf of Guinea, because um, you know what happens during piracy incidents is that you have evidence collected across multiple um, jurisdictions, and then you have instances where um, you know pirates are apprehended sometimes by a state that doesn't have the prosecutorial capacity you know, to handle the pirates. And so there needs to be an agreement in place so that they can hand um, over the pirates to other states for prosecution. Now, I round this up quickly um, by saying, you know, Article 5 of the Yaoundé Code of Conduct provides a, a good point to conclude my discussion here. Because in many ways, Article 5 shows this interface between public and um, private actors in the Gulf of Guinea's maritime governance framework. It it's indicates the intention of the, the signatories to um, take measures to address maritime you know, criminality, to cooperate doing so with private actors, and also in highlights their intention to um, um, cooperate in the protection of ships, you know, measures for the protection of ships, which is key. And it's this interface here that accumulated in, you know, the increasing presence a couple of years back of um, state and back security personnel on board private vessels plying the Gulf of Guinea area. And this was um, happened for some time, especially um, along the coast of Nigeria, Togo and Benin. I'm sure other speakers will correct me here if I'm wrong. Um, but in 2017, the Nigerian Navy announced that no armed guards of any kind would be allowed to um, board merchant vessels plying the Gulf of Guinea region. Instead, they, they um, provided an alternative solution, which was that they would support um, a network of private maritime security companies, which would be manned and then commanded by the Nigerian Navy. Um, and I'm talking about this because, well, currently these agreements exist with about 30 private maritime security companies um, in Nigeria. But I'm talking about this because um, it appears that across the Gulf of Guinea states, the local navy, or at least some public agencies, are actively involved in arrangements that might exist with private maritime security providers. and. Understanding this relationship is certainly important if we want to get a clearer picture of how um, the Navy or public agencies um, and private maritime security actors interact within the context of the Gulf of Guinea and like what compliance issues emerge from that. So hopefully the rest of the discussions will get us to that point. Uh, thank you. Yes. It's more than 10 minutes, no? Yeah, but... Not. It was super interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, uh, for giving us these, explaining these concrete initiatives uh, in the Yaounde Code of Conduct. Um, so now I would like to invite our two, um, our two uh, last experts on stage. Uh, Dirk Siebler, senior advisor at Risk Intelligence, with, which is a, a world-leading company specialized in risk assessment and planning at sea. And Jakob Larsen, head of maritime, sec maritime security at, uh, in BIMCO, which is the world's largest shipping organization. And uh, 
I actually wanted to initiate with a question for our, our former captain Chris Ludvigsen, who is not here, but maybe but maybe the two of you can also say something about this. So we've just heard about this giant infrastructure that has been in place for 10 years and some of the concrete initiatives with legislation and joint patrolling. So with all this in place, who do you call if you're attacked by pirates? Yes, if, you if can I can start. <laughs> if I yeah. can start, yeah. Um, well, there is, in addition to all the uh, regional, um, national West African initiatives we've heard about here today, there's another initiative also going on, which is uh, operating in support of the regional structure. And that initiative is called the Maritime Domain Awareness for Trade for the Gulf of Guinea, and it's a joint UK-French uh, initiative. It's operated out of... Uh, Brest in France and Plymouth in, in the UK and uh, basically it's a reporting center to which the um, merchant ships that have trouble for example come under attack they can they can call and report that they are being attacked and uh, the MDAT GOG as, as it is called they will then contact uh, the different centers in the region and ask whether there is any possibility to get any uh, kind of assistance. MDAT GOG is also in contact with other non-regional naval forces that are operating in the Gulf of Guinea. So uh, typically uh, countries like France, uh, Italy, uh, Spain, every now and then the US, they will have uh, warships there, typically working in support of uh, their fishing fleets or working uh, as a sort of capacity building measure that would typically be the, the US flagged ship. Uh, it's, it's a Navy ship that, that uh, operates in the region, that, that helps the regional navies um, uh, with uh, ramping their, their capabilities up. So when you ask the question, mm. to whom do you report? The question is that the merchant ships, they report to MDAT GOG. Yeah, which now is another initiative. It is another, uh, it's, it's another initiative and it's run yeah. by the, the, the British and the French navies. And you may ask, well, why don't you call uh, the only code of conduct uh, yeah. sensors? <laughs> An obvious question and the answer is, I'm afraid that you can't be sure that they answer the phone and you can't be sure that they can understand what is the problem. And uh, I'm sorry to say it's in such a direct fashion, but there's really no other way of saying mm. it. I have to also say that there are differences between the different centers and as Stephanie also alluded to, uh, some of the, the zones are actually working quite well and I think the best example is really the zone F working out of Ghana. I think it's, it's, a, it's they have reached a fairly high standard. But some of the other centers, uh, national operation centers, they are really not functional and I mean when you're under attack and you only have one chance, you can make one phone call before you have to go down to the, uh, the safe room, it's called the Citadel, then you call someone that you are pretty sure will pick up the phone and will understand what you're saying. And this is why we yeah. advocate that they should call MDAT GOG. That's, that's uh, understandable. So, so in your view, how are the public initiatives working to stop piracy? Well, the initiatives that, that are under the Yonde Code of Conduct, they are not working yet. And, and uh, as Stephanie explained, there are several reasons for that. Uh, and I come from a, a military background, I should say. I've worked for 20 years in the Danish Navy, worked in NATO, and, and then I moved over to commercial shipping. And I spent 13 years there as head of security in Maersk, and now also now working for, for BIMCO, so working on representing the whole shipping industry. I mean, if, if you come from a military background and you look at the way they have organized the Young Day Code of Conduct with the many layers, and you count in that uh, these countries are they are very different countries. They don't speak the same language and they have different cultural backgrounds. They have a different way of, of doing things. It, I mean, it, if I take into consideration my, my NATO experience and, and how difficult it was sometimes to work in NATO together, then, then I think the, the, the starting point that we have here in West Africa it, it makes it uh, quite difficult to, to get something effective out of it. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's really a, a, a key problem here. Mm. I think just just adding to that, um, I think I mean th there are legitimate problems. Completely agreed. Um, but I would say it's not necessarily on the level of the centres. And um, we have to mention that is a the, the whole infrastructure or the whole architecture is a monster that needs feeding. Um, but I would say those centres. Um, 
it, you don't have to imagine anything too fancy. I mean, this is basically two or three rooms, couple of computers, and that's pretty much it. I mean, that's not just a bunch. It's not an, a big operations center um, like you would think of U.S. Navy operations center, big monitors and like lots of monitoring equipment, etc. And and that is exactly the problem. So it's it's not so much the centers, and it's manned by a couple of officers. So again, it, this is not in terms of in terms of um, manpower, in terms of resources needed. It's not actually a lot. But the problem is they don't have a lot of stuff to go around with them at sea. So if something happens, I went to the to the center in Douala. It was in 2014. Um, that's Cameroon, Gabon, um, Sao Tome, and Principe. Uh, and Equatorial Guinea. So it's, it's four countries and they cover quite a lot of sea and there's a lot of stuff going on in terms of smuggling, in terms of I'm not, not talking about piracy um, because this is not an infrastructure to address piracy as such. It's an infrastructure to address all sorts of maritime issues and there are all sorts of maritime issues. So they were just supposed to do something against smuggling, against illegal fishing, against um, all sorts of other things that are going on, illegal migration at sea, which is going on in the region, um, which is also a, a massive factor. Um, and at any given time, they had one vessel that was operational, and that wasn't necessarily at sea. Um, it may have been in port because they had fuel shortages, they needed spare parts or something like that. Um, and those vessels were provided by the different, um, different countries that are um, providing something to the center. So even if they get a call, even if there is something, um, there's not much that you can do if you don't have a ship that's actually going, going out to sea, if you don't have coastal radar stations to actually monitor traffic, if you don't have these assets, you don't have satellite surveillance, etc. There's just not much that you can do. So you can have all the operational centers in the world, but if there's nothing, nothing to operate, then that's just, that's just a problem. And there's nothing that they in, in those centers that they can do to address that because it's a much bigger question, it's a political question about budgets for militaries, budgets for navies, um, and then talking about maritime security, which is probably not the biggest political priority for countries that have all sorts of other security issues on land. So, so my next question was actually that even with this giant infrastructure and millions of euro being spent to feed the, the, the infrastructure, seafarers still fear for their lives when they cross this area so my next question was what's lacking but is is it even possible to point to something that's lacking or since even though we have this giant structure and and a lot of funding for it what is it that's lacking in your opinion yeah, if, if I may yeah, start, um, I totally agree with uh, Dirk that what, what is lacking is really the, the assets at sea. And, and um, if you look at the navies of the countries in the region, they, they're typically made out of uh, uh, patrol boat sized uh, ships, uh, so which are basically useful for, for what I would call uh, sort of normal uh, policing at sea, for example, doing fishery protection or looking after smugglers or things like that. But when it comes to piracy, I it's much more complex. And um, I think the, really the best way to illustrate the complexities uh, is to point to the incident with Espan Snar. And I know there's been a lot of criticism of, of uh, uh, what happened there and so on, but if you just leave the political um, issues aside for a minute and then look at the actual law enforcement operation that took place. Uh, this was a, a standard setup for a pirate action group. They were in a fast moving boat and they were heavily armed. And when they were apprehended by the military forces, they chose to engage in a firefight. And this is not uncommon in this part of the world. And this in incident really illustrates that to take on pirates you need something more than patrol boats. Because a pirate gift like that, it will outrun and outgun any patrol boat in the region. So it's just, it's just common sense. You can't you know, take on a law enforcement job where the opponent is faster than you and has more heavy armory, uh, armament. It, it's, just, it's, it's just logic. And so um, while the Espan Snara uh, operations in the area, they were heavily criticized by the region. They really illustrated that <coughs> this is the kind of asset you need to effectively do counter piracy, at least if you want to do counter piracy at sea. Um, 
personally, I think it's it's much to hope for to to uh, expect uh, regional countries to um, uh, mount such a capability and be able to operate it effectively. It's it's a complex task. It, it requires a lot of training and a lot of dedication and resources. Um, and this is why we in BIMCO have been advocating for a long time that international naval forces like Espensnar should be um, able to operate in the Gulf of Guinea to do effective anti-piracy uh, patrols. Of course, uh, supported as necessary by the regional uh, navies and when pirates are apprehended, the, the region should also be able to, to um, uh, receive the arrested pirates and do the, uh, the prosecution and, and uh, eventually incarceration in accordance with, uh, with international standards. I mean, this is what is needed right now. Yeah. What do you, yeah, do you just, have anything um, to? Yeah. I mean, um, as, been, as as Jakob mentioned, there's been a lot of criticism on the Aspen Snar stuff, and I would agree to a lot of that. Um, but what I also agree with is that, in terms of capacity needed, if you're breaking it down, you had the Aspen Snar, so you had a frigate that had an embarked helicopter, um, that also had an embarked um, detachment of, of special forces who were able to uh, to operate there. So that's a lot of stuff, um, and except for the Nigerian Navy, no no Navy in the region has that kind of level of capabilities. So to an extent, Cameroon, but then you look to Togo, you look at Benin, even even looking at Ghana, mostly what you're seeing, is, as, as Jakob said, mostly what you're seeing is you've got a couple of patrol boats that can operate 50 miles out to, out to sea, um, that can operate a bit longer out at sea, but they don't have a lot of endurance, so they, they can't stay at sea for extended periods of time. So therefore, um, you don't have a lot of capacity when it comes to surveillance, maritime doma domain awareness. Countries simply don't know what's actually going on in their maritime domain. And if you don't know what's going on, it's pretty hard to do something against it. So that's, that's the main issue. And another sort of possible <coughs> maybe add-on to the, to the public initiatives could be to use private guards and private security, which is also of a part of the title for this seminar and you also stephanie you also shortly mentioned uh private companies taking up uh, tasks at sea so how does private security in the gulf of guinea work dirk right um so i i don't know how much your your listeners or how much everybody attending knows about private security so i'll I'll go a little bit into the background of how private security came about on probably good merchant ships um so when we talk about private security what most people at least in the shipping industry or some people who have a casual knowledge of that um associate that with armed guards so basically privately contracted security personnel armed security personnel who have been embarked on ships and that's something that has been extensively used in Somalia or in the Indian Ocean to counter Somali piracy. Um, so they were embarked on merchant ships, um, embarking in a certain port, disembarking in another port, um, and protecting those vessels against attacks by Somali pirates. Now, there's a lot of legal issues with that um, because you put privately contracted security personnel, armed security personnel on a ship which is registered in a certain country. So by extension, it's the territory of that country. Um, so that could be sorted out by flag state regulation, and it has been sorted out relatively quickly. Um, but when that ship goes into the territorial waters of any given country, territorial waters is anything stretching out 12 nautical miles out to sea, so a bit more than 20 kilometers, that's an extension of that country's territory. So any law that applies on land also applies in territorial waters. Now, if you're entering civilian security personnel which is armed into territorial waters there's a lot of countries that don't allow civilians to carry guns in on land and why would they in territorial waters so there's been a lot of issues with that um, and that has been a problem in the indian ocean in the early days it led to armed guards simply throwing their weapons overboard um, before they were entering territorial waters um, which they could because it was so lucrative at the very beginning um, but that wasn't necessarily a long-term solution um, so then somebody came up with the idea of having floating armories. So basically you have ships out at sea where you can embark, disembark guards, weapons, ammunition and all kinds of other kit somewhere out at sea outside of territorial waters. Um, there are also some issues with that, but that's beyond the point. But the main thing was you could, imply, uh, you could, you could apply that in the Indian Ocean because you had vessels transiting the region. They were not necessarily entering territorial waters, so they were embarking armed guards, transiting the region and disembarking um, armed guards at some, at some other floating armories. Um, now, that's something that you cannot 
replicate in the Gulf of Guinea because if you have a ship going to the Gulf of Guinea, you're no normally calling at Lome, Cotonou, Tema, Lagos, at some, some port in the region. So therefore, you are entering territorial waters. Um, and a lot of ships going to the region entering two or three different countries' territorial waters because they're calling at different ports. Um, so therefore, even if you were to embark them at a floating armory, you would be entering territorial waters, so you can't em um, embark private security personnel. Um, and some shipping comp companies have done that in the past, or they had even had unarmed security personnel, and they were, they were detained a couple of years ago. Um, there were a couple of detentions, mostly in Nigeria, um, with ships who had security personnel on board. Um, so that's something that simply cannot be done for legal reasons. And, and a lot of countries have a lot of very good reasons to not allow um, private or civilians to carry weapons. Um, so therefore, there's another solution in the Gulf of Guinea, and Stephanie has alluded to that, that um, navies operate together with private companies, and we can, we can probably come back to how that actually works in practice. Um, they provide security escort vessels, or something that's called security escort vessels, and that can be... Uh, those vessels can be um, can be chartered or can be can be contracted by the shipping industry um, and by any ship operator. So they get a security vessel which is dedicated to that ship going into a certain port, going to a certain country, um, and can operate in that country's exclusive economic zone. And that and that ship, um, that security ship, is escorted uh, is is operated by the um, by a private company, but in coordination with the respective country's navy. So that could be sort of an add-on to the the. The uh, your own code of conduct that which the different countries in the region has has uh, signed up to then an add-on could be that private companies co cooperate with the different navies from different countries that can then follow the ships and protect them or yeah I mean it it, it hasn't come. I mean, this is very much national level, so mm -hmm. this hasn't come to the to the level of the only code of conduct. And based on supply and demand, this is something that has been mostly implemented in Nigeria, um, in some other countries as well. But the vast majority of those security escort vessels and and companies that are operating those vessels um, are based in Nigeria, and that's also for historical reasons because they're not. I mean, this has been applied to the shipping industry and to ships calling at certain ports. But traditionally, these escort vessels or these security vessels were circling around offshore fields, offshore oil and gas fields off Nigeria. So this is where that solution comes from. And that has been expanded um, to the shipping industry because there was spare capacity. But it's not the bread and butter of, of a lot of these companies. In fact, of most of these companies. And, and most companies don't actually bother with transits because they can make um, a lot more money and a lot safer money with protecting offshore oil and gas fields. And that's where that, that, model, ha um, that model has really come from. Okay, so Jakob, how how does uh, Bimco and Bimco's members see this use of pri private security companies? Well, <coughs> the way that uh, Dirk describes it, uh, I, I agree with his uh, description, and it, this is a concept that is employed in uh, Nigeria, where it's commercially owned and operated vessels that are then manned and armed by the navy uh, on a payment basis, and they're also certified and approved by the navy and so on. Um, of course, it uh, provides a level of security for the ships that actually pay for these services. Uh, but on the other hand, BIMCO also has some concerns with uh, this particular model. And we are afraid that when you institutionalize uh, the use of um, law enforcement agencies like the Navy or the police, uh, when you institutionalize the use of, of these forces on a payment basis by private operators, you actually generate uh, an income stream uh, to the people that work for the law enforcement agencies that is uh, a bit unfortunate and can have an unfortunate impact on uh, the way they see their role. So in other words, if you're making a lot of money from the fact that there are pirates around and uh, you have to protect merchant ships from these pirates, you are reluctant to also go out the day after and arrest those same pirates. It's just that that's, uh, that's how money works. I mean, mm. um, at least there's a, a quite a big risk that that uh, this kind of, of of dynamics will 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 play a, a significant role. So this is our concern uh, in principle with the solution uh, of security escort vessels. Um, that said, now in in Nigeria, it's 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 the established way of doing things, and and we can't from one day to the other just go around and change it. So so if you ask the ship owners what they prefer. They would probably say, well, we actually prefer to use a security escort vessel. And honestly, I don't blame them. 
I spent five years in, in uh, Nordic tankers as a security manager and then afterwards in, in Maersk Line. And uh, during my period, we experienced five uh, pirate attacks in this region. And when I spoke to the crew, there was no question in their mind that they preferred to have security escorts vessels uh, with them. So I fully understand where the, the seafarers are coming from. But uh, as a, an organization that sort of represents the, the industry and, and also look a little bit further and head ahead than just the next transit, I just have to raise a flag and say that th this model in the long, long run is, is, is really, uh, it has some unfortunate side effects. Just imagine if we were done here afterwards and we were in a uh, state of insecurity here in, 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 uh, in Copenhagen in Denmark and, and the way you would get security was to, to hire a police officer. I mean, how many crimes would be solved by the police when they could make money on the side working for individuals uh, going from place A to place B? Well, the answer is easy, none. Uh, and this is why, I mean, most countries in the world, they regard such practices as corrupt practices and they won't allow them. But in Nigeria, it's, 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 uh, it's the way it's done right now. Dirk, I mean, do you have yeah, anything? Just you know? um, I disagree with, with that to an extent because there's no direct, no money fly flowing into the Nigerian Navy directly. So the way it works is, as a shipping company, you contract a security company, and that security company has a memorandum of understanding with the Nigerian Navy. So that security company operates this escort vessel, and the escort vessel is manned by a captain and by an engineer. So there's four or five crew members, civilian crew members, on that vessel. And in addition to that, there's a Nigerian Nigeria Navy detachment, and they bring the weapons and the ammunition. Um, so it's not like private companies are allowed to operate these vessels fully with 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 weapons and ammunition, etc. So the Nigerian Navy brings on the weapons and the ammunition, and they're not paid directly. At least that's the way it's supposed to be. There's problems with corruption, as you know, in, in many other places in. Um, in the world, and, th and that's a problem. But there's generally, there's not directly money flowing into the Nigerian Navy. Having said that, um, on a political level, it means that there's not a lot of um, incentive to actually spend money in the budget um, to actually buy new patrol boats, to buy new assets for the Nigerian Navy, because these are provided by private companies anyway. Um, and, and, th and that's the point where I would agree that the shipping company pays extra for security. Um, they're providing something to the to the Nigerian government as such, and and there's a lot of a, a disincentive to actually invest in the capacities of the Nigerian Navy to actually provide that level of security by themselves. Yes, so um, I think we would also like to to invite questions from the audience. So I think I will um, say thanks to the <coughs> thank you thank you to the two of you, and please uh, stay on stage and then invite uh, Stephanie and Jessica back on stage so that uh, the audience can have a go on you. Uh, I can stand over here so that you can be uh, next to your... Okay. Yeah, so we have a little more room. Um, but I think I will. I will start with just to warm you up a little bit uh, with with a question for for the four of you. Um, if you should just <laughs> that's al always an irritating journalist question, but if you were to point to one thing that that would be the most important obstacle to combat piracy in the Gulf of Guinea, what would that be? Yeah. What what thing. Okay. Yeah. So I would So what's say the most important obstacle to to stop this piracy that we see have been rising even though we have yeah, uh, private I, I would say I mean I, I understand that um capacity limitations are heavy on the list, but I would say it has to do more with the the political will of um you know, states along the, the Gulf of Guinea of the Gulf of Guinea states themselves, because first and foremost, it has to be um, seen as a national priority. And once it is seen as such, then maybe there could be more efforts to invest in um, extending the capacity of coastal states to address the, the threat of piracy and amobriacy. So for me, it's more an issue of 
you know, state willingness to tackle the problems. Yeah. Do you have anything uh, to add, Jessica? Yeah, yeah. So I would probably uh, have um, mentioned political will, but since that's been taken, I will take a step back and say, um, where does political will come from? Like we saw during Corona, how states uh, in 24 hours were, you know, doing lockdown and masks and you know all these uh, big coordination things that required uh, loads of money and and activity across the entire public sector. So if the political will is there. Uh, we can we can move mountains, and um, to move mountains, we need to agree on what the problem is. And the thing is, somebody mentioned it also that um, I think I actually <laughs> mentioned it myself. But the, the the differing security agendas at play in the region, and the security uh, issues in the north of Nigeria and Ghana, for that matter, that take priority over piracy, which is more an, uh, considered an international pro or a problem for international shipping, and not so much for uh, local populations. So, so yeah, being on the same page in terms of the the narrative and the security priorities is is, uh, mm. is is the first step to to make things happen. Yeah, and what about you, Dirk and Jakob? Do you agree with that? Or yeah, I mean, if you look at anything? if you look at um, how piracy and piracy and armed robbery at sea, so anything that happens in territorial waters, which is legally speaking not piracy, um, if you look at how that has developed, um, and you look at old reports from the early 1980s, um, then the one region or one of the regions that was highlighted in those reports was West Africa. And even though the ships were flagged in Germany and Sweden and Norway back then, um, you still had reports about incidents of piracy against these vessels. And now um, the flags have changed, but the situation hasn't really changed a lot. I mean, the situation has changed. I mean, you had some, some piracy figures actually in the last two years. It has gone down significantly compared to the to the way it was um, previously, and that has a lot to do with um, organized criminal groups oper operating in Nigeria and having a lot more lucrative opportunities on land and with smuggling and with, with all kinds of other things and not engaging in piracy because that has always been a bit of a side business. But that also means where does the political will come from? Because if this is not the main income for, um, for organized criminal groups, um, this is not the main problem for governments across the region. They have a lot of other stuff to do and spending money on assets that can do something at sea, which by extension is pretty invisible to the to the people on land, um, it doesn't really affect anybody in the region. And why would you want to spend a lot of money on you know patrol boats, on coastal monitoring stations, um, if you can if you don't have enough money to spend on schools and roads and healthcare? Um, and there's a lot of other priorities. And you look at government budgets across the region. So where is that, where is that coming from? So yeah, I mean, that's, that's the big obstacle. And yeah, as I said, I mean, this is not the biggest issue in the region, even when you're looking at maritime security. And when you're looking at maritime matters compared to land-based matters, maritime matters are not the biggest, um, biggest priority in the region either. So yeah. Yeah. So a little bit in the line of what Jessica and Stephanie was also saying that, yeah. yeah. Yep. Do you have anything <coughs> else? Yeah, I think it's a lot of good points that have been raised. And uh, if I can add to them, I think one uh, other key problem is is uh, really... Um, first of all, I want to say I agree with Stephanie. It's a national problem in the sense that this it, it is very much Nigeria. It's 99% uh, Nigeria when we talk about piracy. Um, but, but the problem I wanted to highlight is really the problem of, of corruption. And that really ties together with uh, political will, because if you have a lot of corruption, that also means you normally have an, uh, an absence of political will to do something about the problems, because uh, the money coming up from corrupt practices and crime and so on, they tend to find their way into political life as well. And um, I mean, just look at the internet and all the academic writing that has been done on Nigeria over the years, you will see that, that Nigeria is, is in a very uh, a special place when it comes to uh, the level of uh, corruption and the extent to which organized crime has infiltrated political life and, and law enforcement and so on. So it, it is quite a unique uh, uh, country in that sense. So, so, so that is, that's my, mm. uh, my point is, is really corruption. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, now we can take questions from the audience. We have one down here. Hello everyone, I think I know most of you. I'm uh, Hussein from the Royal Danish Defence College and I also work with the Maritime 
security in the Gulf of Guinea. So I have some, some insider questions that I also think might be relevant for the, for the audience. So uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I think Stephanie and Jessica, you mentioned that this is the 10th year anniversary of the Yaoundé Code of Conduct. And there's been some talk in the region whether that should be updated. There was even some talk about whether it should be made legally binding. I have my doubts if that will happen, but could you please maybe share your views on, on that? Uh, do you think there is like potential, uh, un unrealized potential in the Yaoundé Code of Conduct that a revision 10 years after the initial sign signing uh, could, uh, could bring forth? And the second question, I could ask that to, to, to you gentlemen. Um, there is also this shared awareness and deconfliction mechanism, the SHADE, which is basically supposed to try to link together the foreign navies present in the Gulf of Guinea with the Yaoundé architecture and the, and the countries. Uh, how is that faring and do you think that there is some, something to be gained there? Thank you. Okay, so maybe I can touch on the, the, the first issue you raised. So, Yaoundé Code of Conduct, 10 years on. Um, <laughs> it's very dicey to um, anticipate that there could be, um, you know, like a restructuring of the, the Code of Conduct or the architecture that results from it. I mean, I, I think I've had conversations with, Jessica about this, that this perception of the heaviness of the Yaoundé architecture may be accurate, but it's, it's not one that is necessarily held by states within the region. And understandably so, because then you would be rendering certain rules redundant, right? If, if um, there are actors who feel they are playing a, a critical role within the architecture and we say, okay, this um, part of the architecture may not be so relevant then that sort of leaves them hanging in limbo. So it's very difficult to reach that point where um, states can come together to talk about perhaps restructuring the code of conduct. I do think that it is in order to think about moving it towards um, a, a more legally binding agreement. Of course, this might still mean re-looking at the, the code of conduct and seeing which um, portions of the code of conduct need to be changed. But certainly because of this whole issue of political will, um, then it, it would be much better for the region if, um, for instance, it's legally binding on them to you know, share um, information as much as possible, to ensure that all the centers are fully um, you know, staffed and well equipped to address whatever um, roles that they are supposed to be playing. So just my thoughts, but I'm sure Jessica may have. No, yeah, I think we're pretty much in line here, but uh, in organizational theory, we speak about path dependency, and once you have uh, established a structure, it's very difficult to roll it back. Uh, whether the Yaoundé Code of Conduct should be uh, revised, I don't know, but the, the center structure, there has been talk in international forums about revising the center structure. Um, here and there, it just sort of ebbs and flows a bit. And uh, I think last year I was in Paris uh, where the um, Minister of Defense had invited for this big symposium. And there was also a little bit of talk about it then, but um, I know some of the international actors uh, want the initiative to come from the region. And it's a little bit difficult in the region if, if, if it's already in place and there are resources flowing to these uh, places. Uh, I know you can't compare West Africa to East Africa, but one of the successes of in, e in East Africa, I think, was that a few states were picked to support the international navies operating there. So Kenya and Seychelles and Mauritius were doing the prosecution and the incarceration. It, not all the states uh, uh, on, you know, Horn of Africa, East Africa, not all the states like this uh, Yaoundé architecture, just three <laughs> and and in terms of spreading resources thin and so on it, i think that logic makes a lot of sense but I, I think it's going to if it happens it'll it'll be a while yet okay um so the shade mechanism um just going back for anybody who doesn't know what that actually is which might be a few people um so we had this uh 
decide with the infrastructure in the region. So the maritime, um, the, the, the operational centers on the country level, the regional level, etc. So that's one thing. That's navies and, and navi maritime agencies cooperating. Um, then there's lots of initiatives with like G7 countries inviting African countries um, to the table or the EU funding projects. And there's a lot of talk about EU money that has been spent on funding um, and a lot of that money has stayed in Europe and not actually reached Africa. So the shade mechanism is something different because it brings together the navies in the region, the international navies, and also shipping industry and, and international players. And this is something that has been done in the Indian Ocean before. It has been done with different actors in the Mediterranean um, before. And it's something that is, is um, that has been started um, two years ago in the, in the Gulf of Guinea as well. And this is actually a really good forum. This is because it brings all the relevant actors together. And they have been talking about very, very relevant measures. So I think, I mean, this is one initiative that is that had a lot of promise from the very beginning and that should have been started probably five years ago, uh, five years earlier um, because it actually made um, a lot of progress very early on because it brought relevant actors together who were talking about very operational things and on, on the um, very operational level. So in that sense, it, it makes a lot more sense than a lot of the other initi initiatives that have been going on um, for a number of years. Yeah, many thanks. Um, um First to the question of the own day code of conduct and the revision, what is is the silver bullet? I, c I couldn't say, and I, when I think back of my uh, time in NATO, we also had big discussions on how to simplify the NATO command structure and so on. Totally parallel discussions uh, with the ones we now have in the Gulf of Guinea. Everyone wants to cling on to their headquarters because there's a lot of money involved and fixed position, and it's nice and you know it gives you a nice profile in international community. So it's always difficult to roll back something, but but I would argue that you could probably do away with uh, probably two of the top layers of the command structure uh, in the Gaon Dakota Conduct, and then focus instead on the national centers, so strengthen the national capabilities. It has to be out of the national capabilities that the rest of it grow. So to contribute to something international, you need to have something in your national toolbox first. So I think that should really be the focus. And then the rest of it uh, further up, simplify that, do away with one or two layers, and. And, and, and streamline uh, and, and ensure that, that the, the top layers don't interfere with actual sort of operations. I, I haven't been directly involved, but what I hear is that, that there's been a tendency that once there is an incident that is then brought to the, to the command structure, then everybody wants to say and they start, you know, do this, do that, and, and they don't have a clear description of who has which responsibility, uh, and that is, of course, also problematic. So that's probably the way to go about it. The uh, Shade Forum, I agree, it was very successful under uh, the Somali piracy era. And uh, yes, it should have been started early also for, for the Gulf of Guinea. Um, but again, uh, the Gulf of Guinea is a different place than, than uh, uh, the Western Indian Ocean. And East African states act in a different way than West African states do. And so you have to be aware of that when you introduce something like Shade. I think it has some uh, some merit, and uh, we have also seen some good results come out of it. We've seen a, a communication system being purchased and is now shared among the different uh, naval players in the region. So that's a, that's a good start. Uh, but of course, I mean, you have to take into account all the various uh, agendas that are in play, and I don't mean only the national agendas, but also the many uh, corrupt agendas that are also in play, and you have to to structure the cooperation in shade accordingly to that. Um, so, absolutely. Uh, Nigeria had a presidential election in February. The new government was inaugurated in June, and uh, I think it's just around about now that they are finding their feet, or getting their feet under the table and are ready to, to, to start the work, and then we'll see. I hope that they will continue with the shade mechanism. We've had a break now for a year or so, um, waiting for, for things to, to calm down after the, the elections. Um, but. Um, it's certainly one to look out for, and it has it has potential. Thank you. Yes. Uh, any more questions? A gentleman here. I have a question regarding this. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, this uh, lack of anti-piracy legislation. Uh, you say that only three countries had like introduced specific uh, like legislation in this regard. So uh, from the map we saw in the beginning, it seemed like most of these pirate attacks take place in uh, around the coast and not in like uh, at the high seas. 
don't these countries have like a regulation in place that is not specifically focused on pirates, but focused on, okay, you're not allowed to shoot people or you're not allowed to kidnap people and stuff. So can't this uh, legislation be used for these pirate attacks, which I su- assume mainly takes place in the territorial waters of these uh, these uh, these these countries. So do you, do is is this a showstopper, so to say, that you don't have specific regulation for pers- for, for prosecuting pirates? So this was my question. Good question. You're absolutely right. Uh, in Denmark, we we don't have a, a definition of piracy in our criminal law, and so we have to pick relevant clauses that deal with like don't kidnap, don't shoot, don't <laughs> these kinds of things. Uh, so it is possible, and it's not a showstopper, but of course it makes it much easier when the 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 warships are looking for piracy attacks that look in a certain way, and you can collect evidence to have a proper proof in court of piracy l- being in a certain way so it's it's not a showstopper but yeah it's it's of course better to have the proper legislation um, and i don't yes. know if okay yeah yeah i agree and and uh, i think it's important to dis- distinguish between piracy and uh, what goes on at territorial uh, inside territorial waters which, which is inside the jurisdiction of a country and is therefore by definition not piracy so piracy is everything outside 12 nautical miles and not all countries have criminalized that. There, there, is, there are provisions in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea that criminalizes piracy, but each country has to take the, those provisions and, and implement them in their own legislation. And not all states have done that. Denmark haven't done it. Um, and many of the countries in, in the Gulf of Guinea haven't done it. So, so it becomes now a question of if a crime is committed, uh, say, for example, against a Danish flag ship uh, in, in international waters in the Gulf of Guinea, then it's the Danish jurisdiction that will have to uh, do the uh, the prosecution uh, of, of that crime and uh, if they can't get their hands on the pirates or whatever then of course that is difficult um, so it, it depends on which jurisdiction is applicable and because so few jurisdictions have this universal provision against uh, criminalizing piracy then, then that makes it a lot more difficult so what we actually need is for countries in the region who who could do the prosecution and, and subsequent imprisonment of, of pirates, we need them to criminalize piracy uh, so that the pirates, when they are apprehended, they can be handed over to those jurisdictions. Now, some may argue, and especially from the region we hear, but if you think it's so criminal, why don't you just take them to Northern Europe and, and prosecute them there? And it's just not politically viable. I mean, they will seek asylum, and all of a sudden it will become a a venue to or a route to um, to prosperity instead of uh, uh, the opposite really so so it 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 does just doesn't work so again pointing to east africa and what we did there 10 15 years ago as international society i mean that is the recipe it worked like a charm we just need to do the same and the problem is that there is reluctance in in the among gulf of guinea states to to really do what is necessary unfortunately I'm just 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 adding very quickly um i completely agree with with what you said i mean if 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 there's a pirate group or if there's a there's a criminal group they're taking hostages somewhere on the high seas yes that is piracy that might not be criminal but they're bringing those hostages back to land back to nigeria put them in a hostage camp they're released against a ransom there are very strict measures in place very strict laws in place in nigeria against kidnapping mm. um that hasn't stopped kidnapping from happening in Nigeria, um, but these laws are these laws are in place. So even if they can't be convicted for piracy, they can be convicted for something else. Um, so that's completely up to the point. That means obviously arresting them and actually prosecuting them, and there are issues with that. So that's the main problem. And those piracy laws, um, I think that's a longer discussion, but I think there's a lot of justification in that for um, international agencies who have um, got some funds from international governments, and it, it gives them something. Um, look, we've, this is what we've impl- implemented, and there's a lot of, you know, we've, we've shown that. And with the Togo case, for example, that has been mentioned earlier, um, Togo has some counter-piracy legislation in place, but in that case in particular, that actually took place in territorial waters, so they could have been convicted under the existing laws that were in place for anything that happens on land as well. I don't know if I can add yes, to this. Yes, yes. 
Um, I th- I think it's really interesting what you just raised because I, I had never really looked at it um, from that angle. But even um, with armed robbery at sea, which is what happens within the territorial waters of coastal states, or even with incidents of piracy that in the end move in towards the territorial waters, I think um, one, one of the limitations we're just making do with existing laws is that most of the time, these incidents have their own complexities, you know. So, for instance, you could have, um, you know, an incident then that happened off the coast of Togo, where the vessel was then moved um, into the jurisdiction of another state. And so we have these, um, you know, these problems that arise with the multiple jurisdictions along the um, Gulf of Guinea. So it's just much easier to um, prosecute the the offences committed in these instances if there are specific, um, you know, piracy and armed robbery at sea legislations in place, right? And it's also easier to um, work towards, you know, evidence gathering and, you know, um, sharing of evidence across the multiple states actors involved when at least there are some measures in place to cater for these nuances. Okay. Yeah, just to supplement, uh, it's also a legal question. I forget what it's called in legalese, but if outside of uh, the 12 nautical miles, say there's a piracy incident and uh, the navies that appre- or the navy that apprehends the suspects are mandated by international law and piracy has a certain definition in, in UNCLOS, and then if they're then prosecuted for something else, uh, I, there's some, I forget what it's called as I say in legalese, but, but you have to be of course, apprehended and prosecuted for the same crime, so you can't just like say, okay, now we're going to, oh, it, yeah, we have to use the kidnapping clause or something because you've done something illegal, but actually it doesn't quite fit. So, I mean, there has to be a, a parallel between what you're arrested and accused of and that you, what you're prosecuted for. Yes. Well, I think we used all our time, so uh, yeah, I just wanted the Thanks to all of you for being here and for good questions and good behavior. (laughs) And thanks to our four speakers. And uh, yeah, let's give them a hand.